I think that, yeah, Jiang's weird personality also gave a lot of uh, these, you know, U.S. officials or other world officials cover to embrace China and the CCP. Remember, Jiang came to power. He was appointed general secretary of the CCP in 1989 by Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, like like three weeks after the massacre. Yeah, and because he, was, he supported it. Yeah, and he was there. Well, because he was able to put down a student demonstration in Shanghai, mm-hmm. and he supported Deng and the hardliners' policy of like putting down the student demonstrations. So he was replacing Zhao Ziyang, the 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 general secretary, who went to Tiananmen Square and tried to beg the students to leave before the tanks came in because he knew what was going to happen. Uh, and then, whereas Zhang Zemin also knew what was going to happen, but didn't beg the students to leave. Well, I mean, he was in Shanghai at the time, but the whole thing was that Deng decided he needed to replace like a patsy like Zhao, who was, you know, trying to save the students' lives uh, with somebody who would just obey instructions, right? Mm-hmm. Like, While also not being like a, like sort of a Li Peng hardliner who, who wouldn't have pushed the economic reforms that Deng you know, that was Deng's thing, the whole reform and opening up. Yeah. Zhang also went along with that. Yeah. Although Deng had to reprimand Jiang in like 92, Deng's like southern tour. Yeah, in his tour. southern tour. Yeah. Because, yeah, he, he said something. Like he went to Shanghai, Jiang's power base, and was like, the pace of economic reform isn't keeping up and the central leadership, wink, wink, is to blame. I don't know why he said the wink, wink sounds. But. <laughs> Uh, well, but, you know, Deng had a personality too. Yeah. Like he wore a cowboy hat. Look at that. So Western. Uh, but yeah. Is that all it takes to have a personality? Well, I mean, I guess if you compare it to um, Hu Jintao or, you know, Xi Jinping, who are very reserved. Well, Hu Jintao figures. had a personality. It's just that that personality was the same as a block of wood. Well, no, we the another video that we posted on our channel that was very very popular is a video of Hu Jintao as a young man, very was, happy, energetic, and, human almost, and like the difference between that and like the joke about him being I mean, a block of wood, wood face is what they call yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, you just like it's kind of like the CCP sucks the life out of you, like to oh, actually yeah. get to the position of being general secretary or in the Politburo standing committee or something like that. Like you have to do a lot of terrible things. Yeah. I mean, the the whole culture is struggle. So like you don't have friends. You have people who you can either manipulate to further your ambitions or enemies trying to destroy you. And sometimes you're not sure which is which. Yeah. Yeah. And but yeah, so this whole nostalgia about Jiang is so strange because, I mean, he committed crimes against humanity. He's responsible for like launching really the organ harvesting of prisoners of conscience to what it is today. He was able to, with his persecution in Falun Gong, he basically set up the police surveillance state that is now being used to persecute Uyghurs. Uh, Zero COVID would not be possible without the system he set up. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that people have to understand about the CCP is like once you set up a system, uh, it is very hard to get rid of that system. Mm -hmm. So once Jiang decided that he needed to set up like a nationwide uh, like surveillance system and a system that almost superseded like other communist like state organs and things like that in order to be able to like persecute Falun Gong across all the different like departments and stuff like that in the government and the party. Then the that system that he set up had to do something after they ran out of Falun Gong mm-hmm. practitioners, right? Like that's not going to go away because you have this whole system where people have been making money, where people have been promoted, where they've like learned this whole repression system. And what happened uh, after 2009 uh, with the Xinjiang? Yeah, uh, I mean, you can't let all that training go to waste. Yeah. So then like it moved to essentially persecuting Uyghurs. And, you know, people have written, I think there was an article in the Jamestown Foundation about this. And there was an article from China Change that looked specifically at the fact that there are people who rose up through the ranks persecuting Falun Gong who were then transferred to Xinjiang to mm-hmm. persecute the Uyghurs. So it's literally the same people, the same system being used all over again on a different group. And now with zero COVID, you have the beginning, like that being used on a nationwide scale. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's 
there's a lot of nostalgia, not just on like the Western, like, oh, Jiang was a wacky guy who combed his hair at, you know. In front of the king of Spain. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and like did all this like weird karaoke all the time and stuff like that. But also there's nostalgia on the Chinese side. And it's kind of a pointed thing where it's like comparing life under Xi Jinping and life under Jiang Zemin. And the idea was like, oh, things were so much better in the good old days. Shit, not if you were a Falun Gong practitioner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's actually, it's interesting that like uh, Jiang's persecution of Falun Gong was not mentioned in his official obituary. That is well, interesting. Because he wasn't successful, I think. I mean, he, he was su to some degree successful, but I think not the way he I don't know if that's hoped. what it is. I mean, that that's that requires us a lot of thought and analysis. No, I, like, I, th I, wonder I think about. he was humiliated because he initially said that he could get rid of Falun Gong in three months. And he failed so badly to get rid of Falun Gong because the, the sort of strength of the community was so much greater than he I mean, I, I could imagine it's like also a decision like they don't want to really call attention to that. Then like it's like, oh, this embarrassing defeat of Jiang Zemin. There, there, could, there could be a lot of other reasons. Well, I agree with that. But I also think I'm right that that's a, an important reason. And I hear that you think you're right. <laughs> I hear that you hear <laughs> that I think I'm right. But let me tell you. Uh, uh, but I think that a lot of this nostalgic about Jiang, it's like people don't really remember what happened. No, in, no, in, definitely in, not. I mean, a lot of the people were probably only born uh, in the late 80s or 90s or whatever, like were not alive. Or, yeah, I mean, it know. was a time when like, like after Mao, like you could actually make some money. And that meant like people could buy things and like it was like a, objectively there was an improvement in the quality of life. Yes, if you compare it to what it was under Mao, there yeah. was an improvement generally, although uh, China's entry into the WTO and the turning of China into the world's factories also exacerbated a huge rural urban divide. Also massive pollution that is probably going to completely destroy the country now or in the next 10, 20 years. Yeah, there was a Chinese... Um, like a Chinese commentator, um, Wen Zhao, who compared it to um, like th it seemed like the the good life was happening under Jiang uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, but it was like borrowing off a credit card. Yeah. And now you have to pay the debt. Yeah. And well, so that's that's the issue, like especially for a lot of young people, um, you know, people who were maybe like just born in the early 2000s, like their parents had done better. And now they're getting to the point where like there there are no jobs for young people in China anymore. Zero COVID is a mess. So they just have this general idea that like, oh, things were, you know, better for our parents back then. Things are really bad now. And they don't understand that everything that's happening today is a result of Jiang Zemin. But, but can't you just get a new credit card and transfer your I think, I think that's what the the CCP is hoping that they can do. <laughs> Until they can, like, the environment is so completely destroyed, they don't even have any water. Yeah, and I think things like, uh, yeah, China, like, a lot of people did have a better economic life, but also it was, like, a terrible, difficult transition for a lot of people with... Um, yeah, I mean, there was still huge uh, wealth discrepancy. I think, like, still, like, 700 million people make less than $10 a day, well, China's still and, very And poor. think about all it, the all the like rural people who were encouraged to move to the cities to after China entered the WTO and became this world's manufacturing hub. There were all these people that for decades were doing this like almost slave labor, even though they were paid, but paid minuscule amounts, f forced to essentially live on campus at the long factories. long hours, no Crazy unions, hours, no like, rights. No, yeah, no unions. I mean, China has an official trade union, but they're designed to make sure people don't unionize. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah, just like, like horrible, f unsafe conditions and making all this cheap stuff. And at the same time, like, you know, Young people who had kids like had to leave their kids back in the countryside with the grandparents. And like it just destroyed these families, ripped them apart, put people in horrible conditions for a really long time. Uh, I mean, US companies look at this positively because so many companies were able to get the same products for so much cheaper. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's so much cheaper to just hire some rural Chinese person to make it.